Hello, everyone. So I am delighted to be joined today by Az Mumtaz, who I connected with through CPN. And uh, Az shared with me that he is writing a book called Hope. And uh, the, the communication there was really about how CPN, the channel, was well, we'll find out more, but was in some way helping or inspiring with the with the continuation of the book. And uh, as is in New Zealand, so we can also talk a bit about what's happening over there in New Zealand with regards to these changing crazy times. So first of all, as thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. And the first question that I ask everybody in these interviews, I think it's really nice for people to hear as much as you would like to share about your background. So whatever you'd like to share about where you're from, but, but more importantly, when was your realization, your awakening to the fact that the world is not the way that we've been told that it is? Um, well, Probably when I was about 17, I would say. Um, pretty much from when I was starting to become aware of bit becoming uh, from a uh, teenager to a adult that um, I questioned a lot of things. I always had a questioning mind. Um, from there, really, I went into... Uh, living my life like most people do, uh, got married, traveled to New Zealand, settled here, um, raised a family, mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So around 40 was the next real major turning point where I started questioning all the systems that were in place for uh, running our lives. And so between 40 and 50, um, I was probably my major awakening as regards to understanding that the way that we live our lives and the way that we are asked to live our lives, more importantly, isn't always conducive to our well being. And so around 18 years ago, um, I started getting the inspiration in order to write the book. The storyline started forming in my mind. Um, and anybody who is creative will tell you that um, the creative inspiration comes from somewhere else other than your mind. Um, most artists really say that it is something they can't really explain. But anyway, it came to me gradually. It formed over a period of years, probably. And then it took probably another, or oh, maybe another 12 years. I started the book properly in 2014. So uh, nearly nine years now. Um, and the opportunity was when uh, our boys turned into gorillas and left home. We asked whether they were coming back home, and we said, and they said, unlikely in the near future. So we um, decided we'd sell up um, and travel in a motorhome around Europe, and uh, that's what we did for a year and a half. And during that period of time, I had plenty of time available in order to basically write the story. So is the story uh, hope um, a fiction or is it? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So it covers um, a number of different topics, obviously. Um, but I decided to write it in a way that it would make it interesting for the reader. So to give you a bit of a praise, um, so the intro to myself, really. So I um, was 
born in uh, northern Pakistan. Uh, my mum's family was from Kashmir and my father from Lahore, but it, of course it was all India then. Um, when I was eight, uh, they emigrated to England to get treatment for my sister who was physically and mentally handicapped from birth. And so I spent the next 16 winters in England before I managed to um, meet my wife who was from New Zealand and uh, decided that uh, we'd get married and travel to New Zealand and see what that was like. Um, so that's a bit of a background to me, but um, as I say to people, um, did we have a choice where we were born? And does that influence um, the person that we are? So it's, a, it's an interesting question and a lot of people don't really think about it. Was an Italian an Italian before Italy was created? Well, it raises a couple of... Well, the first thing was you said you survived several winters in England. So at that time you were probably quite um, grateful or uh, happy that the, the, the lady in your life was from New Zealand and you could escape to somewhere warmer. Yes, well, the first, we arrived in October and so that was the beginning of uh, spring summer here and then we went through summer and before i knew it the daffodils were coming up again and i said oh the daffodils are coming up when when does winter happen and they said oh we've just had winter i've so never been was, to new zealand was, yeah actually. it was a big change um a very pleasant change to answer your question as regards to um how I decided to write Hope and Why, um, I was questioning a lot of the structures, basically, that we are imposed on our lives. And so it basically formulated, and I decided I'd write it as a story, uh, as fiction, but uh, build into it all the facets and the things that we deal with. Um, so to give you a bit of a pricey of uh, the beginning of it, it uh, it's set in South America to start with. And uh, it's in the past. Um, and I don't say which country because I don't really believe in countries. Um, and so there's a conflict going on between rebel forces and government forces. And um, on one side, uh, there's a mercenary, and uh, on the other side, there's a lady called uh, Makita, who is um, on the rebel side. And um, basically, they are destined to meet each other. Um, and in the conflict, basically, Makita, instead of killing um, Stefan as the uh, mercenary, she spares his life because uh, something passes between them as as their as their eyes meet. Um, something that is uh, prevents her, and so once the conflict is over, she takes him away to an area where he recuperates and then they t tell the story as he asked why she saved his life. And she explains that when she was a younger girl or a teenager, her um, grandfather took her to a village in the mountains where um, a elderly, woman called her over who she'd never met and said, Makita, one day you will save a man's life. Um, you will know when you look into his eyes who this man is. And Stefan, in disbelief, says, well, that's amazing because I never thought this day would come because a very similar thing happened to me in my native Serbia where um, I was taken to a village 
away from where I normally lived and in a marketplace, a old man came up to me and said, um, Stefan, I have something very important to tell you. One day a woman will save your life. When she does, you are to follow her. And so that's where the story kind of begins. Okay. Um, the next thing is uh, basically they make a journey to a community that is waiting for them. And there uh, Makita gives birth to a baby girl and they name her Hope. And so then does it continue uh, the, the story through kind of the life of hope? Basically, not so much the life, but the journey. So she leaves the community when she's 25 years old. The day has arrived for her departure from the community and to go back out into the world. And there she makes a journey and meets various people that she needs to meet in order to make the changes that those people will help instigate in order to change the society that we live in. All right. So it's also um, ultimately leads into societal change as well. That's right. So before we go perhaps into the societal change i want to jump back to what you mentioned before about um do we choose to be italian for example right um, two answers come to me one of them is this idea of uh the ego uh that is you know often referred to in spirituality and buddhism and uh, hinduism and many other religions and Yes, that um, the way I describe the ego, I'm, I've been meditating for a very long time. And uh, the way that I describe the ego is that it's the, the conditioning, the social conditioning, the programming. And what meditation is about is connecting to that part of us that existed before that conditioning was formed. Right. So it doesn't matter if you were born in Italy or in another country, until you know that you're Italian, until you know that you're a man or that whatever it is that you uh, discover about yourself and learn yes. who you are, you still exist. And the other yes. answer to your question about do we choose to be Italian goes back even more esoter esoteric to do we choose the life that we're born into um right so yes, i'm just that's, wondering that's an interesting question yeah very good yeah so um around when i was around 50 yeah around when i turned 50 i finally managed to read eckhart tolle's uh, the power of now and during that period, I managed to become present. And when I experienced becoming present and stopping my mind activity, I saw the reality of what this life is actually like. Um, and very much he talked about ego. And so um, I understood that we all have an ego and that the it is very clever in the way that it operates so that we try and deny its existence, basically. Um, but going back to the question about um, whether we're Italian, I totally agree. I mean, basically, um, the conditioning, which is a big thing that I mention in the book, is given to us from day dot. Um, one, of the, one of the things I did earlier in my life is um, I did a bit of uh, adult education. And I said to them when I used to start at the beginning, do you believe what you've been told? And most of them say, oh, yeah, most things don't believe everything. I said, well, I want to tell you that I want to put a, pose a question. There's a 
one particular big thing that you've been told, which is a lie. So that would grab their attention. And then I'd say things like, um, you know, when you were, before you went to school, if you got something wrong at home, what would happen? Oh, smack, time out, no treats. I said, right, so you learned very early that there was a consequence to getting things wrong, according to your parents. Then you go to school and you get something wrong in class. What happens? Uh, the teacher tells you the right answer. What else? Um, uh, the other kids would laugh at you. Right. How did that make you feel? In New Zealand, they say stink. Right. So it uh, made me feel stink. I said, right. And so, but that was a very strong conditioning part of your life, wasn't it? that if you got something wrong in front of your peers, it was a really bad thing, eh? And they'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, you leave leave school, you go and find yourself a job and you're down the pub having a drink. And one of, the, one of your mates gets something wrong, what happens? Oh, everyone else laughs at him. So how does that make him feel, really, even though he's got thicker skin and a lot older? Oh, stink. I said, right. So all through your life, you've been told not to get things wrong. Otherwise there's consequences and conse the worst consequences are the people laughing at you. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, guys, how do, you, how do you actually learn in life? So the penny dropped at that point and they realized that the real lessons they learn in life is, is, are through their mistakes. And so I said, okay, so there you go. That's the big lie that we've been told. We actually have to make mistakes in order to learn properly during this process we call life. And so it set the, set the ground for basically them engaging in the rest of the course because they weren't afraid of making mistakes. Okay, so the going back to the conditioning as far as whether we're Italian, French, Irish, German, or British, um, is it's part of the deal that society imposes on us to raise the flag and raise nationalism. That way, I believe, it causes separation between us as individuals and as a community. I saw it very starkly um, when we were traveling around Europe, that, you know, you would go across a border, say, between Serbia and Italy, and one side was Italian, the other side was Serbian, but on the Serbian side, there were Italians that would speak Italian, you know? Um, because the border was, you know, a line drawn in the sand. Um, the peoples that were living there beforehand and that mix across the border uh, is, is not really there for them. Um, so to me, it's, it's very important that we understand that we don't need to separate ourselves according to the tribe or the country that we've been born in. Absolutely. I mean, I would add also to that, um, for example, should a woman wear, um, what is, I've forgotten the wet name. Hijab. Yeah. Over the Hijab. face. Yeah. Um, uh, the answer to that question depends completely on your conditioning, where you grew up. Or, you know, trying to find examples of things that are quite controversial. Um, you know, right now, you know, socialism, communism, right politics, left politics, all of these things depend completely on where we grew up, what our parents believed, which country we were born in. And if you take all of those things away, it goes back to this, you know, what's left. You, you mentioned something earlier, which um, 
I'm trying to remember now, but the answer to that for me is intuition. Ah, that was it. When you were talking about uh, artists and when they create something and that they right. describe where that comes from. So for me, I mean, there's many words for it, right? There's soul. Sure. And, but for me, I talk about intuition and I talk about the subconscious because I do hypnotherapy also. So you're taking people into the subconscious. Um, right. But it's, it's an inner knowing that is there before or regardless of yeah. our, our, our programming. Right. And um, if people can really grasp this idea that the reason that I believe that uh, you should eat your soup before you have your, your main course, and in Portugal you have your soup after the main course, <laughs> is purely right. because of where you were born yeah. <laughs> then you can really start to understand the extent to which what we argue and what we fight about is actually circumstantial and a waste of time and well certainly d divisive and yeah. as you said you know it's uh, separating and mm. um moving in the opposite direction to what we should be doing, which is finding where we meet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, divide, uh, a waste of time, the only thing I would say about that is, you know, we live in a dualistic world. You know, we live in a world which is hot and cold or that where we have positive and negative, um, you know, polar opposites, uh, a battery, for example. So we're getting quite philosophical which i like but at, at what at what point is it a waste of time you know because we do need to use labels to some extent to identify yeah. a female and a male for example right yeah and even that is becoming um gray gray areas um so the thing is Roberto we can we can discuss these things we can have things in place in order to uh, you know run our lives um which you know certain number of structures are very important without those you know we wouldn't function but it's the ones that stop us from getting to know each other at a heart level those are the ones that i've addressed in the book okay um they are the ones that stop us from really understanding the being that we are and the desire within each one of us in order to be loved and to be able to love. I think that is the bottom line as far as um, I can see that, 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 you know, that my understanding to this point um, the, the things that stop us from doing that is one of the biggest things I've found is fear. It's fear of rejection, fear of uh, non-acceptance, uh, that whatever we may think may cause a division between ourselves and the person that we want affection from just because of our viewpoint. And so that particular um, part of our lives is a big deal for most people. And we will have seen over the last three years, since you started this channel, what fear can do to people. They can, t you know, rational human beings suddenly turn into, you know, non-thinking individuals that, uh, logic goes straight out of the window, right? You know, so so the thing is, wh when we understand the bigger picture of who we are as a being beyond the physical body, then we are, I think, have a chance of being able to live this life without fear. Once we know the finality that this is a, a journey 
that you're making from point A to point B, whatever point B may be, um, that during this journey, you will learn certain things in your life. You will have certain experiences. And how you want to make that journey, what labels you want to be able to uh, carry with you, what burdens you want to carry on your back, those are the things that can be discussed and um, hopefully understood so that we can make this journey in partnership with our brothers and sisters without fear getting in the way. Yeah, if you speak to people that work, you know, uh, with therapy and helping people, and um, not, not all therapists, of course, but many of them and many of the people that I've spoken to in, um, and interviewed also that do some type of therapy work would say that fear is, is it, fear is the thing which is limiting us and cause, if you go down to the root cause of our problems, it's fear. Yeah. You see, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve, much to my detriment at times. And the reason is that, you know, I don't want to beat around the bush. I want to be able to get to the heart of the matter and, and to be able to share this life as best as I can with all the selfish motives that I may have, right? When I've that self-analyzed myself, I'm, you know, I'm selfish because I've taught, I've been taught to be selfish. And to a large degree, I haven't addressed that sufficiently in order to say, well, there's no need for that. You don't have to live this way. Okay. And so um, if when we go to uh, say um, how we want to live our lives, okay, I've got a few bullet points here that I wrote down in order to try and discuss with you. Um, I think the, the, the bottom line really for me is how do you want to live your life? How do you want to live your life? Do you want to live it in fear or do you want to live it in some other way? And if you can see that there is some other way, a, a better way to live your life, a way where you can be yourself, whatever that may mean, without having to create a facade in order for us to interact with everyone else so that people will like you okay yeah so that you know i cover that in in the book as well what you're yeah. what you're describing there for me is i i talk about wearing a mask so you know right. and then and then talking about wearing a mask we could talk about you know the way the the, the way that we often behave in a diff we become a different type of person in a different in different situations and scenarios but mm -hmm. um but really deep down when it what, what you're talking about is when you you know wearing your heart on your sleeve which i've always done as well is just being your authentic self and not right. being afraid to be your authentic self yeah that's right the example you know, I, I, it makes it so much easier, eh, Robito? You know, then, then, then you're not, you know, you're not beating around the bush, uh, trying to pretend some uh, to be somebody that you're not, and, and very exhausting. Yeah, really exhausting. I think you know part of the problem mentally uh, for people is that well, there's a number of things, but that's one of them. That you know they. they keep putting up this image. I see it here in New Zealand, as well as many other Western countries, where they're creating images. You know, the media is creating images for people to live by. And those images are just unrealistic. They're just totally not 
what we, you know, what we are and what what we can be. Um, they're just um, facades or masks, as you put it. You know, there was an amazing movie a long time ago um, called Mask about a boy who was born with a bone disorder and it made his face really distorted. And um, so often his mum was, um, I think it had Chris Christopherson in and um, oh, who's that famous lady singer? I've forgotten her name. Cher, I know the movie. Cher. Mm. You remember the movie, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'll always remember the line in it where, um, he, you know, the boy goes to school and, and one of the kids there says, hey, why don't you take your mask off? And he turns around and says, I'll take mine off when you take yours off. <laughs> and so, you see, a lot of people are afraid, you see, to do that because they think that, you know, people won't like them if they find out that they're selfish or that, you know, they have these indiscretions or uh, fallibilities but you know to me that's part of life you know we're not we're not we're not perfect human beings but you know we're 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 imperfect and if we celebrate that as part of life and chill out basically as far as i'm concerned um and not worry about it and concentrate more on the things that are important like um, being kind to one another and to accept one another and, and to relate to each other at, at a heart level, it will feed so much positive stuff into each other and help us enjoy this life at a much deeper level than the superficial level, the, you know, the media and the corporates would want you to stay at <laughs> absolutely uh, a, a, a kind of um I, I like to give examples that people can relate to and this is through my own experience before covid i was very nomadic and traveling a lot um, right i saw some of your journeys there you were making recently <laughs> Yeah, well, I used to, I used to be, uh, I used to, um, yeah, I used to travel a lot more before COVID. It really did change my lifestyle. But um, uh, when you go to a hostel, you don't need to go to a hostel if you're in a, if you're in a, a, a party, and um, you don't feel like talking to anyone. So if you just go and sit in the corner and just do your own thing, you know, when I was younger, I would talk to people because I would worry, I would be afraid that if I don't talk to them, that they will think that I'm antisocial, that I'm not a friendly person. Yeah. And then when you, when you develop this um, authentic self and, and just try, I'm just going to try and just go and sit in this corner and read a book or do my own thing and just hope that nobody has some you know some bad thoughts about me and you realize yeah. you realize yeah. they don't care they're busy doing their own thing and they totally understand that you're not in the mood it's all going on in our own heads it's just the one example that i have that's a kind of one that pe people can perhaps relate to that i've experienced through my journey i think the judgmental mind is one of the things that's a big barrier you know that we, you know, we fear being judged by other people, and you can understand that because we do we do a lot of judging ourselves. You know, um, the old saying of uh, "Don't look for for the speck in your in your brother's eye when there's a log in your own." All right, so um, very much the um, the case there. Um, but, you know, the thing is, Rubito, that there's so many different things, right? So I just wanted to cover COVID a little bit. Um, to me, um, there's, there, there are now sufficient people that are going to be able to bring us out of this um, in a manner which 
will reveal the re you know the truth of the um, companies behind uh, the creation of 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 the this you know engineered virus um so but so i don't need to worry about it too much right i don't need to uh, i've investigated it you know to a large degree i spent a large part of my time doing this rather than con completing the final edit of my book <laughs> uh, um, it will happen uh, it's happening. I'm, I'm not too far away from uh, completing it now, and it's on the final edit. Thank goodness. Um, but you know, people like I just want to mention Robert Malone, as well as people like Peter McCullough and Ryan Cole and Pierre Corey. Um, they have, you know, really put it out there. You know, they've they've put themselves totally to be ridiculed by their peers in order to be able to make a point and, and to live by the ethics that they have been, you know, um, taught or come to understand. Um, and I found Robert Malone in particular very, very um, helpful and very clear and concise. So, that leads me on to the G20 and the WHO. I think most people that will be viewing your channel will understand what the story is going on here as regards to control over the masses. But what struck me was that the G20 agreed with the WHO not so long ago. And to me, that, you know, that, that's sufficient alarm bells in order to be aware of it and to then um, uh, take appropriate action in the form of creating communities, right? Um, so to me, the way forward, there is no perfect society and I don't think they should be because we're human, okay? We're not, um, we're not subhuman. Um, but, but in that creation of those uh, societies that can exist within countries as they exist at the moment, I think there is sufficient will and purpose now. I think there's not enough direction as regards to how it's going to happen, but I think there is sufficient will and what I call, uh, what I believe is a change in our consciousness. So I, I talk about this in the book as well. I believe that consciousness is changing gradually and now at a more accelerated rate so that people that accepted things the way they were um, as opposed to with how they can be are increasing in number, okay? So that gives me great hope um, and, and it gives me a further incentive in order to encourage those that want to go there, right? And um, there's a certain percentage I've found um, that just aren't, you know, like in the matrix, aren't in a place where they can be awakened yet. I believe everyone can. It's just the the extent of the conditioning and the extent of the fear from living their lives the way that they have always known to living their lives in a radically different way, which, you know, creates apprehension for many people. To me, change has always been part of my life. So, you know, when I was eight years old, there was a major change. When I was 18, I uh, went with three of my friends from uh, school and traveled around Europe for a month in, on Interrail. And so at that point, the travel bug hit me. I felt like a different person from the beginning of the month to when I 
walked from the train station back home. Um, it was just an amazing, awesome experience as an 18 year old to um, go through. And from then I realized that by traveling, I would see many, many different cultures and different people and how they were living their lives. And that to me was very interesting. Anyway, so going back to um, the way forward, I think once we um, have sufficient people that are connected, um, we will be able to create smaller communities um, of people that are wanting to relate at a heart level and to help each other to get through this life, um, both financially and um, emotionally. So, um, oh, there's a lot more I want to say, but please, um, I don't want to take up. No, go ahead, continue. <laughs> okay, so the idea of hope originally was to get the message out, to get the message out to people that they don't need to live their lives this way and to question some of the structures, okay? From the main three structures that I cover are religion, politics, and economics, okay? Um, there was a book called The Shack um, by William Paul Young, I think his name was, um, which was Christian-based, but he basically um, addressed the fact that these were the three main control measures in societies throughout the world. And they worked hand in hand, in fact, in order to keep that control. So economically, if we don't get a job, we can't pay for food and clothing and housing. Okay. Um, and politically, the, the ruling of getting somebody in a position of power to rule over our lives because we don't want to take the responsibility. <laughs> right? That's, it, it, it's a, a divulging our responsibility, basically, divorcing it to somebody else who then we can blame when they get it wrong. Right. One of one right. of my uh, continual, you know, repeated sayings in posts on CPN is we are the ones we're waiting for. We are the heroes that we're waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when I saw CPN, I knew that this was part of the deal, that this was the connection that I needed to make. You know, when we walk, uh, say, if we walk into a room where there's a party, we 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 tend to gravitate towards one or two people. And that's a connection that is probably spiritual. I don't know, but we do that. And we walk down a street and we sometimes take a second look at somebody that we wouldn't. Those are the connections that we can make if we allow ourselves to, if we get over the barriers that keep us apart. Okay. So, my idea with the book is that if it becomes reasonably successful, I will use 50% of, of the um, monetary stuff coming in, in order to create setting up these communities. It's already happening in New Zealand and, and obviously all over the world. People have finally re you know, woken up sufficiently to realize that the state is not in their best interest, okay? and that the economic system is based on being a slave, basically. You know, I say to people, oh, do you like your job? I said, oh, well, yeah, it's okay. It's paid slavery, but, you know, it's all right. It pays the bills. Um, the other 40% 40, uh, 40 then would go into research into natural medicines and alternate systems and ways of being able to create and investigate all the uh, knowledge that thousands of years uh, has created in order 
for us to be able to live in a more holistic way. And 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 my wife and I ran a organic orchard for three and a half years. So we got into understanding how good um, organics are for our body, how amazingly different it tastes. Um, and then finally, the ten percent remaining will I'll, that'll be my interesting projects that I get involved with. Are they personal? Uh, you know, like. Uh you know, just things that you want to do? or Yeah, they... that's right. Th mm. Things that I would like to be able to do um, that money will allow in the short term. But the other 90% will go towards something very worthwhile that is part of the process of creation that is happening around us. Well, first of all, that sounds fantastic uh to, to to do that and well it brings up a few points for me one of them is this whole concept of money is evil and uh you know money is not evil it's what you do with the money right so right exactly if, if you're a millionaire and you put all that money into uh building communities that uh, you say you know are, are kind of heart-based yeah so that you money. know you're living for each other right yeah and then also, well, whatever the project, you know, if you were taking all the homeless people off the streets or something, it's not the money that's the issue. It's what we're doing with the money. This yeah. was part of my journey because for many, you know, you go down the rabbit holes, you see how money works, you see who's at the top. And then you think, well, money is evil. But of course, it's not money that's evil. It's the love of money. Yes. Yes the 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 holding on to it the, the needing it um there was something else as well i remember now i feel there's a process i feel first of all we wait we go through the cognitive dissonance realizing that what we've told is not the reality which is a grieving process and then I feel we, we then want to find out more information. We want knowledge. So then we go down the rabbit holes and then we come to a conclusion that we're all stuffed because it's all doom and gloom. And there's this giant network, which has been there for decades. And then I feel that we move into reclaiming our health, as I put it. So now I need to get back into balance. Now I need to refocus on what's going to make me healthy and well. And then the final stage is what you were talking about, what you would do with the money from the book, is how can I now contribute to a better world? Yeah. Um, and I feel that there's, as, as you say, there's many people now that are waking up. You know, there's different words for that, but there's still a lot of people that are feeling that we're all stuffed. Um, there's still a lot of people that are going through the grieving process. Um, there's still a lot of people that believe that the issue is um, the Democrats or Trump or Biden or Trudeau um, and are looking also for revenge as well. That's another part of it as well. Okay. So. What would you say to people who who say, you know, but it's all right talking about living a heart based mm. reality, but but we've got a fight. We've got a war. We've got we've mm. got uh, we've got a struggle ahead. What would yeah. you say to those people? OK, so first of all, I'm glad you asked me that, Roberto. That's exactly what I needed. Okay, so first of all, how do you want to live your life? Okay, that's the question I would say to everyone that is listening to this. How do you want to live your life? Do you want to live it in fear? Or do you want something else? Okay, so yes, we are facing unprecedented times. But hey, if the last three years hadn't happened, a lot of you wouldn't have woken up. You would have just carried on your lives the way that you had been before Mr. COVID came along, okay? So that's first thing, okay? Very, very important. 
because as I said to a, a local group here in New Zealand, if it, COVID hadn't happened, if the adversity hadn't occurred in our lives, you wouldn't be sat here next to each other trying to figure out a better way. Okay, that's the first thing. Yes, I can see that there is a lot of work ahead of us. Okay, but it doesn't need to be work. It needs to be. I'm looking forward to every single day so that I can move forward in a positive and exciting way. All right. You know, if you take each day as excitement, as uh, I often say to people, okay, look, you can look at religion, you can believe in it, but it doesn't make it so. Okay. You can look at the Big Bang Theory, or you can look at a creator that made everything. It doesn't matter. That's your choice. It's your opinion. You're entitled to it. Okay. But whether it was a creator or whether it was a big bang that allowed us to have our existence, it doesn't matter. It's a miracle either way. Right? So if you want to live your life as if it's a miracle every day, then it's your choice, okay? It's your choice whether you want to be a Republican or a Democrat and fight over these things, or you do something positive in order to create a better society. Gandhi said, be the change you want to see, okay? Very wise man, okay? Now, the thing is, we can do this but you don't have to look at it as a skyscraper or a mountain before you. Okay? You just need to take one step at a time. And the rest, I can assure you, will happen. Okay, In my own life, things have fitted into place like a jigsaw. Okay, When I've looked back, as they say, when you look back, the road straightens behind you. You take a very long and winding road most people in this life, very many ups and downs if we're honest with ourselves, as opposed to those that are not honest and say, oh, they've just had a fantastic life and nothing's gone wrong. Now, that's just not the way it is. And that's not the way it will be. But you don't need to be afraid about it. You don't need to be afraid about the um, fact that the G20 and the WHO are trying to impose incredible restrictions on our lives so that they can control them. You know, the book 1984 pretty much laid it out as it is now. And George Orwell was an amazing, you know, uh, seer. There's been many, many prophets in the past. They have put forward ideas to the people around them in order to live their lives in a different and a better way. Most of those prophets have been killed. I think there's a Bob Marley song with the words to that effect. Anyway, the thing here is, yes, it will be difficult, but you don't need to be afraid that it's difficult. Anything worthwhile in this life I've found that has been difficult, has been really satisfying. It has given me satisfaction by overcoming and being able to deal with it, okay? So I would encourage everyone, do not give up. Winston Churchill, after the Second World War, went to Eton Boys School he was asked to speak there. And so everybody was expecting this amazing speech from Winston. And he said, never, 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 never give up. And sat down. That was his whole speech. And so you can imagine what that would have imparted on the boys that were sat there in front of him, as well as the teachers. Okay. 
And so I would encourage everyone to continue down a path that is going to allow connections between each other that will satisfy your inner being in ways that you cannot imagine. You cannot imagine them until they happen. And then you will know the reality of how amazing a life this can be. But you have to believe it first. Right? If you have doubt that this can happen, it won't happen. If you believe it can happen, if you have the intention, which we have now found through many people doing research, that it's our intention that actually drives our lives, then it will happen. It may not happen straight away. It may take a number of years or months or days. It just depends. Okay? But it will happen as long as you don't give up. So that's what I would say to everyone listening here, okay? There are amazing things happening that I did not think would happen in 10 years ago, okay? Just amazing connections between people all over the world. The fact that this particular interview is going to connect to many, many people around the world, I am so pleased. I have been waiting for this opportunity for quite some time. Okay, the book is just part of the deal. It's just one piece of the jigsaw. The rest will fit into place and you can look forward to a future of great hope and encouragement. Okay, it won't be airy fairy stuff. It'll be practical stuff that we do in order to make societies that are enduring and meaningful, compassionate, and all those things that you are really, really looking for, that your heart is looking for. You know, there's a connection between your heart and your brain. They found this. There's a heart-brain connection that is very important that most people need to experience love by the time they're 20 years old and those connections are made. Right. So that's my two bobs worth. Okay. So, I, I, you know, I can give you a lot more, but really in the end it'll be down to each individual to say okay i can run with this i won't give up i'll rely on a few people and it needs three or four other people in your life that you can rely on in order to keep you encouraged and moving forward in a positive way rather than waste your day every single day do something you know whether it's meditation or whether it's actually constructing these societies or groups or whatever you want to call it, whatever label you want to put on it, it will happen, okay? Because there's a thing called looking glass. I don't know if any, if you're familiar with this, Rubito. Uh, looking glass, uh, I don't, I, I've not heard of, the, I've only heard okay. of Alice in Wonderland. So, it, it, was a, it was a thing that was um, through the intelligence services in America, and it had a way of being able to basically do what a prophet or a um, precog does. Are you familiar with precogs? Yeah. Right. Okay, so it basically foretold a future where society would not be the way it is, that there will be a amazing change that will occur gradually. And no matter what the inputs they put into this looking glass machine, it kept coming up with the same result. Okay. So they've hidden that whole project. They've shelved it, they've buried it so that other people don't find out about it. But certain people did find out about it that were in the know. 
and they release that information. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you believe, right? It's down to you. You know, you don't pass the buck. I used to try and pass the buck and not take responsibility for a number of things. Now I know that if I take responsibility, it's down to me and nobody else. I don't have to rely on a politician or a religious leader or even a corporate in order to enjoy this life, this miracle of a life. Yeah, I was talking to Sue Parker Hall, and she's a, a um, transactional ana uh, analyst, a, a psychotherapist. She was talking okay. about the, the story that we are told um, when we are very, very young um, creates the limiting beliefs that we then repeat through our lives over and over again. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when you say that the intention is what will happen, I'm just imagining what some people might think. Some people might think, oh, law of attraction, rubbish. But if the story that we're told when we're very young makes us have limiting beliefs that we keep repeating then logically yeah. if we rewrite those stories and we have or well, she talks about stepping out of that story but if you have a new intention then that will start to manifest and unfold in your life yeah so it's just absolutely Try, trying to, I mean, like like you did now with, uh, you know, the heart is connected to the brain and the, 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 the information coming from the heart is immense. Um, I think these types of, uh, the, the, the science that can explain the spirituality is so important for people to take that step to believe in the first place. Because one, once you give it a go, then you then it all starts to happen then you know that everything falls into place if you trust um but it's that first step of you know we talked as you talked about before facing the fear and doing it anyway is yeah. is is the hardest step there's going to be it people is. that have just listened to what you've just said and they'll, they'll probably have tears they'll feel very emotional and feel like yes i want to but how, how to take that first step? Right. Yeah. So I, I would encourage them to uh, connect with one other person and say, hey, look, this is how I'm feeling. Uh, how do I go about this? Right. Um, the other thing is to just meditate um, and make that connection i find by going to nature or going down to the sea or a lake or something like that and then meditating it really helps as regards to making that connection and, and cutting out the mind activity the doubts and stuff that we all suffer from you know i can you know this interview isn't long enough in order for me to explain all the uh, ups and downs i've had in my life but there have been many, you know. I, I have gone through depression, so I know what it's like. Um, I know that it's a hole that is very hard to climb out of. But fortunately, people can do that and they can, you know, basically never go back to that place because they've been there and they don't didn't think it was at, at going to be any good because you don't get anything done <laughs> um so those ones that you said robito that are feeling that you know they are downtrodden that they're fearful that they don't know how to go about doing the next step forward i would just encourage okay there's another guy called joe Dispenser that has done a lot of research actual research into our intention Okay, to have the intention to look at the glass half full, to wake up to a sunrise 
and a sunset. Have you ever wondered, actually, everyone, why you find a sunrise and a sunset attractive? Why do you find it attractive? There's something inside us that makes us appreciate it. I can't, I can't fathom it, but it's very, very good for our system to be able to see a sunrise and a sunset. The sunrise causes the pituitary to produce certain hormones that help us wake up and energize our body. The sunset allows, I think, melatonin to be produced, which helps us sleep. Okay, so there's, there's various things there that if you look for them, they will reveal themselves, okay? But you've got to look. It's not going to suddenly come and land in your lap, okay? You have to make the effort. Once you make the effort, it will happen. I can guarantee that for you. Very few guarantees in life. But that one, it will happen because I've found it to be so in my own life. Once I've lo let go of my real agendas, the things that are selfish, and look for things that are genuine, then they have presented themselves from other people. Okay, they have come into my life and made my life richer. It will happen, okay? It's just a case of you believing that it will, have the intention, and work positively every day in order to make it happen, okay? It doesn't take much effort. Stop watching TV, stop watching the news. That will free up some time. Yeah, doom scrolling. Right? Yeah, focus your mind on this, you know, the positive stuff. It's amazing the research now, you would know this, Rubito, that the, if we meditate for only 10 minutes out of our day, which is, you know, insignificant, it makes amazing changes physically within our body, let alone the mental positive stuff that is uh, created as a consequence of it. You know, I find it very hard to become present because my mind is always thinking, I'm always thinking ahead. I'm one of those types of people, the 20% of the population that always thinks ahead as opposed to looks behind. 80% look behind at the past and see, try and figure out how they could have changed it, which of course they can't. Right? So there is very much within your own power in order to do it. The biggest hurdle is your doubt. Once you get rid of your doubt, once you work on it so that you reduce it, once you get rid of the conditioning of your parents, of society and so forth, that is saying, oh no, this isn't possible, then it will become possible. And only then. But just uh, again, fantastic. I would just quickly add uh, for people watching this who haven't tried meditation, you said it's, it's difficult for you to be in the present. Meditation just means being here now because there's people out there that there's, uh, it seems to be a thing in the US where the, the Christian church seems to be sharing that meditation is some sort of evil practice. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's it doesn't meditation is not a problem for Christians in uh, in Europe as far as I know but in the US there seems to be a lot of comments in the channel about how it's evil um it's just being present it's just being reading a book walking in nature playing a musical instrument all of those things well not walking in nature while you're on your phone but just observing what's around you is meditation um it, it's because it's linked to the new uh, new age movement, as the Christians called it. Okay, I went through Christianity for a while, so I understand it. Okay, um, 
in fact, quite some time until I started questioning things around 40. And, and there's a great guy within the Christian world called Richard Rohr. And he said, there's three main phases of, of your life. The first third of your life, you're basically growing up, learning the systems and stuff in place. The next third of your life, um, you start questioning those systems okay, that you have learned and come to accept. The last third of your life, if you can't get over that hurdle of questioning and finding and leaving, and he said, in fact, you have to leave the church in after the second third of your life in order for your spiritual journey to continue in a way that was intended. Amazing guy, you know, telling people to leave the church. <laughs> so the, the meditation thing, going back to your question, Rubizo, is to do with the fact that New Age movement, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and so forth, use meditation. So by association, they feel that it must be bad, right? They don't understand that all meditation is, is stopping your mind from thinking for a period of time. And most people that try it aren't able to do it because they've never been in a position to be able to do it. And it's a simple exercise. It's no voodoo or weird, you know, stuff that is going to detrimentally affect you, you, it's actually going to do the opposite. It's going to affect your body and your mind in a positive way. And you're not going to go down suddenly a sect and follow something which is going to be detrimental for your life and those people around you. In fact, it's the opposite. Yeah, right. you're not you're not going to be uh, possessed by a demon or something because you right. stopped because you've you've focused on the the leaves moving in the trees for a while. Yeah, mm. yeah. You know, in in the book, I mention a story um, when Hope um, talks to five different religious leaders from different religions. And she asks, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the story as regards to Cain and Abel? And um, those that know it uh, say, well, you know, it's because the Muslim religion has a different, slightly different uh, storyline to the Christian one. But basically, one of the brothers uh, was a farmer, the other was a uh, like a shepherd and raised cows and they both gave an offering to God and one offering was acceptable because it was done in with the right intention apparently or the right things and the other wasn't and as a consequence one brother became jealous of the other that got accepted by God their their offering and killed I think Cain killed Abel is that right I think so anyway I said in the book, why on earth would God allow the first murder on this earth to occur? If, if the God that we have before us is a loving God, he would not allow this to happen knowing the events that were going to lead up to it. So what's the, what's the learning exercise here from, from Cain and Abel? Never allow something that you think is better in God's eyes in order to get his favor over your brother. Never allow that separation to occur. That's what the story is actually about, if you look deep enough. Uh, what, is there anything else? You said you've got some point, bullet points and some things you wanted to share. Is there anything? Uh, I've, covered, I've covered them all, Rubito. Tribes and flags. The main thing is, you know, like in New Zealand, we have tribal, we have a um, um, bit of a conflict going on between Maori and non-Maori and 
um, is causing division. And to me, um, you don't need to create divisions according to where you were born, how you were raised, what culture you belong to, which country you belong to. Those are all things that separate us, not unite us. It might unite the tribe, right? But it won't unite society. And it's the society that the tribe lives in. And it's multifaceted, multicultural. You know, you can you can follow your culture if you want to, if it gives you um, a feeling of wellness or, you know, it, you, you get something out of it. So, but don't impose it on anybody else. That's just like imposing religion on somebody else, saying, well, you have to follow this particular religion in order to get to heaven. You know, the thing is here, Heaven and hell and all this was created, right? Originally, um, in the Christian uh, world, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, in you know, if you believe that, um, he referred to hell as Gehenna, and Gehenna was um, actually a valley about ten kilometers south of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem had a problem with waste in the city so they used they figured out it would be a good place to get rid of it in gehenna which was already known to be a bad place because that's where child sacrifice used to go on before the jews turned up so they would dump all their rubbish there the problem was that when the wind blew in the right in the wrong direction all the smell from all this rotting stuff from gehenna would go into Jerusalem. So the authorities decided, oh, well, they'll light the rubbish and burn it. And so Gehenna came to be known as a place where the fire would never go out and there would be worms there in the, in the rubbish that would never die. So that's how the concept of hell came around, place of eternal fire and a place where worms would never die well all i can say is doing these interviews is fascinating as well just to meet people that however you want to describe it on the same frequency uh, you know i talk about we're tuned into the same radio station <laughs> and then just to just to learn just to learn and i think that's also perhaps an important message is that you know once we once we say that we've woken up and you mentioned this earlier the learning doesn't stop you know this is a, a constant evolution of consciousness so um okay so i guess it should be. yeah i guess my final question but i think you may have touched on it just now when you were talking yeah. about the different tribes and the division and the separation but what if if you had to sum up hope the, the, the message, the one message that it's trying to share, that, it, that the message that it's, it's, uh, that, that it's trying to, to, to kind of share with the people. And I imagine that would also be because it's your book and you've spent nine years putting this together is going to be your one message as well. Uh, what would that one message be for the people that either read the book or that are watching this now? was a big one to finish yeah big one to finish how, Very do, you appropriate. how do you sum it all up <laughs> okay so when I was trying to figure out a title I, I, I thought about destiny as well but um, that's been taken over here in New Zealand by a um, organization calling itself that I thought about hope faith and love from the Christian uh, perspective as well not that it's based that way because you know it's well beyond religion uh, which is restrictive in its um, in its outlook you know it's closed in other words you have to believe a certain thing in order to get a certain result um, that is a you know closed way of thinking so 
in summary, <clears throat> um, in order to get to a point where people understand why uh, they would find it beneficial to read hope, I would say that it is a catalyst that will help you move forward towards an outcome which you desire. It's a desire that is in your heart, okay? You know the extent and depth of it when you look for it. It will happen, okay? If you look for this, hope will help you. It won't give you an answer, but it will give you the means in order to continue your journey towards a level of happiness and satisfaction that you couldn't have imagined, that you only hoped for, that will happen, okay? It's just an aid, I would say, okay? It covers and addresses many things in our lives that we have come to accept which are detrimental, that once you recognize that they're detrimental, you can look at the alternatives which are in the book, okay? I give the alternatives to the way that we can live our lives. And it's amazing freedom. That's all I could say. It, it will make a difference if you believe that it will, if you have the intention, right? And Jesus used this actually time and time again. If you look at the text, he would ask the person that he was going to heal emotionally or physically um, whether they believed that it would happen. And so that's pretty much the summary, I would say. You know, it, it will happen and hope will help you towards that happening. Yeah, you finished with freedom. And I also say, you know, we free ourselves within. The, the freedom comes from within ourselves. It's not going to come from somewhere out there. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, As. Uh, do you have a website yet for your book or any? No, I don't. I'm links? going to get my older son who's into that sort of thing to create one once I get to the end of it so that when I'm ready to launch the book, um, then um, I will uh, create the website. Um, however, I know there's somebody out there and this is how it works. I need somebody in order to do an illustration for the beginning of each chapter. I've got the title, the page for the front, which is the um, birthplace of hope, pretty much. But again, if there's a fantastic graphic artist that is wanting to um, put forward their ideas, I would love them to um, get in touch with me and we can talk further. Uh, so how could some, so normally at this point, people share any links they have and things like that. So how, how could people contact you then if they'd like to talk to you about the book? Okay, so either through uh, Telegram or um, they can email me on uh, my email, which is... Um, H for Harry, A P double E Z at proton dot M E. That's P R O T O N dot M E, proton mail, basically. Um, so it's H for Harry, A P for Peter, E for elephant, E for elephant, and then Z, a P's at proton.me. And that's probably the easiest way I would say um, in the first instance, and then I can give you contact phone numbers and stuff like that. 
Perfect. So I'll share that in the description wherever anybody is watching or listening to this. Um, but it does go on Spotify as well, which is obviously not a visual. So it's good to also if you if you just say it out loud. So that's perfect. Um, okay. Right. I think that's it. As thank you so much for this uh, for this interview. Hey, my pleasure. It was fantastic. Turned out really good. We related well to each other. So that's um, that's always a good thing. I could feel it straight away from the moment that you started talking, feel this, ooh, okay, yes, we're in this space now for the next hour, <laughs> hour and a half. Thank you very much for, uh, for the interview. I'm sure it's going to be really inspiring for a lot of people. And if anybody out there would like to uh, either help with the illustration or find out more about the book, then certainly feel free to send at, uh, as an email. So right. thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Rubito. You have a great evening. I'm going to have a great day.